Hello, my name is Andy Greenwald. This is my podcast. Today's episode is a great one. I got the chance to speak with a legendary Hollywood producer, the CEO of Valhalla Entertainment, Gail Ann Hurd. She came in today to talk about her new project, which is a USA series called Falling Water. The show premiered last week on Thursday nights at 10 p.m. Eastern. You can catch the second episode tomorrow at 10 p.m. Eastern on the USA Network. It is a very stylized, very trippy story about three people who maybe can share the same dream. Uh, it's a beautiful show. It is a very dense show. It's a very intense show. I was excited to talk to Gail about that, but I was also very excited to talk to her about the length and breadth of her really amazing career from starting um, with Roger Corman, first as an assistant, and then eventually learning the ropes of production where she met James Cameron. She went on to co-write The Terminator with James Cameron, produce the film. She also, of course, did Aliens, uh, Terminator 2, The Abyss, a movie that I still ride for and forced her to talk about during this interview. Um, in recent years, uh, Gail has turned her talents to television. She produces a little show called The Walking Dead, uh, which is doing okay. Uh, we talked a little bit about that um, and generally about her life in Hollywood and the focus it takes to be not just a super producer, but a producer, as well as the enduring presence of sexism in the industry. I thought her in in answer to that question was particularly interesting. Uh, let's get into it. This is my conversation with Gail Ann Hurd. Gail Ann Hurd, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I hope you don't mind. I would love to talk to you about Falling Water, which is your latest project. Um, debuting this week, I believe, on USA. It is Thursday, October 13th, and 10, 9 central. And we're going to be airing this post that, but just ahead of the second episode. So okay, I good. think I can say you can tune in for the second episode tomorrow. Although I highly recommend watching the first episode first, because <laughs> it might be a little bit tricky if you don't. It is a serialized show, so it, it tends to be helpful it, it to is. have caught up before you take the next installment. I have to say, I've seen two episodes of the series, and the thing that was most fascinating to me was what was chosen for the previously on Falling Water segment, because I had no idea what was going to be picked out as relevant for the next episode, because there's so much. It is a very dense, very intense show. Um, well, just think, you can binge on it multiple times and, and get something and new find each new, time. How many times have you seen that pilot at this point? Oh, probably 30. And is there still... Are there Absolutely. Still I mean, first you've got to remember it's directed by Juan Carlos Fresnadillo. Yes. And I'm a huge Juan Carlos fan. Um, for those who may not be familiar with his name, he directed 28 Weeks Later yes. and also Intacto. It is a gorgeous piece of filmmaking. I'll say that first and foremost. Um, and we will, I hope, talk about other aspects of your career later on in the interview. But I do want to talk about Falling Water because this is, as we're alluding to, a very, very ambitious uh, piece. This is basically a show about dreams. It is very, very hard to talk about dreams, I find, in real life, let alone make art about them. So can you talk to me a little bit about what, I guess a two-step question, what intrigued you about the project, and then what made you believe that you could actually make a show out of it? Uh, I've always been interested in, in dreams, um, and also in sleep, because at times I'm a complete insomniac. <laughs> yeah. And when I was at Stanford, my alma mater, I took a class called Sleep and Dreams by Professor William C. Dement. It turns out that one of the creators of the show, Blake Masters, was also at Stanford a number of years after me who'd taken the same class. Wow. And it clearly stuck with us. And not only that, but his mother, as well as the late co-writer, Henry Brumell. Henry Brumell, yes. Uh, both their mothers were psychotherapists. Apparently Freudian, Freudian and Jungian. Huh. So, you know, obviously dream imagery is really key to both psychotherapy. Right. So still, though, they, and they've written the script. And so we should, just to backtrack, um, Blake Masters uh, had worked with Henry on, um, did he work on Homeland with him? Is that where they had crossed paths? Um, I they think had... they worked together on Brotherhood, which on Brotherhood. was Blake's show. Right. And, um, and and Henry Bromel is a, a titan in TV writing, and I got to meet him once, and just a brilliant man who passed away far too soon, worked on the script together. The type of work that would go into something, I mean, writing a pilot for any project is challenging and fraught with its own demands, and you have to write something that plays 
in the moment that also potentially could lead to five, six, seven years of storytelling. But something this dense, this ambitious, has to have, I would imagine, a whole other level of thought behind it. So what were those con- early conversations like um, with, those, with those guys about what this could be, what it needed to be in order to be sustainable? Well, the first thing is making sure that it was rooted in things that people care about. Right. In other words, our three central characters are all seeking something we can all relate to. Right. If you've got a metaphysical show that gets too heady, right. um, then you're just layering metaphysics upon metaphysics. And we watch TV to connect with characters. That's true. At least I do. No, I think that's what <laughs> connects all TV shows, even if they're very disparate in tone. We always want to fall in love with the world and spend time with people we, we like, regardless of their circumstance. So each character is seeking something that's missing from their lives. Tess, who's a trend spotter, um, is convinced she's had a baby because she's seeing this boy in her dreams. And yet there's no evidence that she's ever had a baby. Um, and then the character of Burton, who is a fixer, sort of a security guy who mm-hmm. fixes problems that executives at a financial services company might get into, um, is madly in love with a woman he's having a passionate affair with, but he can't find evidence that she exists. and But he's connecting with her incredibly deeply in his dreams. And then Taka, who's a police detective, nicknamed The Hunch, has a catatonic mother. And he's trying to connect with her, and he sees her in his dreams. Well, it turns out they all share something in common that not everyone has, which is that they are powerful dreamers. In other words, in the show, we we, uh, say that if you're a powerful dreamer, you can leave your dream and enter someone else's. Not all of us can do that. Is is the idea of being a powerful or more powerful dreamer than someone else based on on science? Or is that that where the fiction starts to take over? Not the entering other people's dreams specifically, but the idea that some people dream more viscerally than others. I think that that there are ve- there are good dreamers. Yeah. And I think there's, you know, there are people who remember their dreams, there are people who have much more of a sense of déjà vu. Right. Um than other people. And I know that I go through cycles. Uh when I was making the Terminator, I would dream very vivid dreams every night before the next day's shoot about problems that could happen on the set. I mean, a- a- albeit these are not sexy dreams. Yes. But I would solve these issues in my dreams, and, you know, every few days, one of those problems would arise, and I'd already figured out the answer. Oh, that's good. That actually seems constructive. I I always feel like my anxiety dreams, like, Freud would be bored by them because they're so obviously anxiety dreams, and they're just so on the nose that they would be laughed out of any uh, psychotherapist or writer's room, you know? I, I feel like I, I wish I could get to that level where they were more interesting and someone would want to well, I don't know them. that it's really interesting, you know, what to do with it if the grip truck breaks. Right. But, <laughs> well, um, but, but it was, it, it was it relevant. <laughs> but it was relevant. None of these characters are... They have, they have a lot of problems in their lives and in, as the show goes on, but none of them seem to be troubled by insomnia. I was very impressed no. by their ability to no, just... They can, they can <laughs> sleep at the drop of a hat, which is a skill I'd like to acquire. I, yeah. But, but the interesting thing that Juan Carlos brought to the show is working with Blake to create the visual grammar. Right. So there are very particular things. I mean, we almost always see someone's eyes closing, mm-hmm. and then we know that the next sequence we're going to see is them in the dream world, mm-hmm. or their eyes opening, and we know that we're back in the waking right. world. Um, we also tend to have slow motion, mm-hmm. and the slow motion is used in the dream world. Mm-hmm. And the, the camera tends to move a lot with our characters in the dream world as it's propelling them forward. Um, you know, often you'll be in one room in a dream and the next thing you know, you're someplace else. That was my favorite. That was my favorite part. That was the part that felt most like a dream to me in it. And I, I, I was wondering what those conversations were like because you're dealing with something that is abstract and artistic, but you're making a TV show. You're in production. You have to have rules. You have to have a visual storytelling language. And if I were to sit and tell someone about my dream that I thought was very exciting, although I just established mine aren't, but if it was, um, I, you know, I think we all know the look on people's faces when you're telling them a dream and it's not at all interesting to them. So what were those conversations with Blake and Juan Carlos like in terms of, okay, well, this sort of slow motion, this sort of feel, I mean, I don't even have the language that I imagine they had to come up with to describe how to make something communicate as a dream. Well, the, the important thing was really that we were propelling people forward, that everything that happens in the dream world 
is like an Easter egg that's going to be relevant later on. And in some cases, um, there are real threats and real jeopardy from characters that we don't know quite who they are right. or what they want um, that we'll find out later. And the first encounter that our characters have with them is in their dreams before they encounter them in real life. How much of the, the development process was about finding the correct balance between, as you said, characters and making sure that we are grounded in the characters, even if they themselves are not grounded, versus you know, the, the, the fantastical imagery and ideas that support the rest of the show? I think the most important thing is that we care for these characters. We understand what it is that they're seeking and why they get roped in to, to things beyond just mm -hmm. their waking world and the things that they do for a living and realize that there's something deeper and, you know, more mysterious going on. Mm -hmm. um, and that really the, it's a fight for control ultimately of the world. The other thing that drew me in instantly is that you do have um, wonderful diversity in the actors that you, that you cast for the project. How much of a priority was that, or was this simply, you know, these were the best people right off the bat? Well, Taka was all played by Will Yen Lee, uh, was always written as a, a sort of Korean Japanese American detective, mm -hmm. but we didn't write him as if that's what defined him. Of course, right. Um, and what Will has loved about it is that if you close your eyes and you're not looking at the character, if you're not looking at, at the actor, it's any New York police detective. It, it wasn't just written for someone. You know, it, it does ultimately, um, you know, it's, it, it's important because at the end of the day, you know, we're, we're dealing with someone who, is, who has their own issues, their issues with their mother, um, and, uh, you know, that, that's always going to be defined by our cultural mm -hmm. background. Um, but it's not the most important thing about the character. Mm -hmm. And Will was saying he's never played a character like that. In the past, his cultural background has always been the reason for his character's existence right. in a show. Um, and with David Adjula, who plays Burton, the security consultant, um, it was written... It was written for a white actor mm -hmm. and a white American actor. Mm -hmm. And when we saw his audition, we said, he's the perfect Burton. And let's incorporate the fact that he's British mm -hmm. into the, the character and write it into the show. Yeah, it actually helps, I think, in the way that he's so he's othered from his context, from that the, he, he's in an, what appears to be, at least in the first two episodes, an all white, very American, good old boy kind of office. And he's the one tasked with. Right. watching them. Which... Yes, I mean, you know, the, the, the masters of the universe, really, the financial yeah. services. And you're right, he, he is an other. Yeah, which I think this show steers into smartly. Um, I imagine, um, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of things. I don't know the life of a producer um, the way you do clearly, but you, I imagine it would be possible in project to project to take a macro view of everything and, and you know, be looking at everything or to really have fun losing yourself in the weeds and the specifics of each individual project. And one of the things that I appreciated most about Falling Water was the level of detail and care that went into finding and well, not finding but recreating the sort of freak folk LP that plays a role in the second episode that people will be able to watch tomorrow assuming they listen to this when we put it up um, everything down to you know, sort of the aged LP cover uh, how am I right in thinking that that sort of thing can be fun for a particularly obsessed producer or production designer and then how much work ends up going into that well you know it's it's something actually that Henry before he passed away and Blake talked about a great deal wow uh, and it really is mind bending mm -hmm. that particular element of the show mm -hmm. if people are paying attention um, and uh and it was it was so much fun. I mean, really, it was inspired by Bob Dylan, mm -hmm. and um, you know, and, and and music and the oral, the audio of the of the show is incredibly important. As Blake likes to say, there's one sequence that took us six hours to shoot, <laughs> that took four hours on the dubbing stage. Wow! To dub, and that's how important. So anyone yeah. who has a fantastic audio system is at home, the show was meant for them. 
where were you in development when Henry passed away? Uh, how far along was the was the project? Literally, we'd had our first meeting two weeks before. Wow. I'd read the script. We'd met. I said, I love this. I had a few notes. Um, they had gone away to, to talk about them. We were going to be meeting again the next week. And then I got the phone call from Blake that he'd passed away. And we, we put the project on the shelf for a year. And, and it was just, it was too difficult. I mean, I didn't know Henry well. Mm-hmm. Blake was incredibly close to him mm-hmm. and just couldn't focus on it. And then we realized, you know, this is a show that will live on. Henry lives on through the show. And he lives on also with a, with a co-creator credit, and he's in every, every episode. His name is right there. Um, from talking to people like Alex Gonzo, who worked closely with Henry on, on Homeland, and, and from my brief time with him and other people who have worked with him, and just from looking at his CV, um, it's pretty clear how gifted he was, and also specifically the, the role he played with a lot of other writers and showrunners, younger writers and showrunners, um, you know, sort of keeping them on a character track, keeping them true to who these people were and their motivations without, you know, not keeping an eye on the trees and not just the forest, basically. This is a show that is a very large forest that has a <laughs> lot of trees. Um, going forward, and obviously you're only in the first season of the show, um, what do you think Blake has been able to do or what is, what is he prioritizing in order to do that um, going forward on this project? Well, literally with every episode, he has that conversation with himself as if he's in the writer's room with Henry, Mm -hmm. saying, what would Henry do? What would Henry say when, you know, if if, if he were around to read the script? What what were the critiques that he would give? And for you, with so many projects on the air and in development, how do you apportion your time to keep an eye on each tree while you're tending to the forest? I mean, Falling Water is is successfully launching this week. It's the first season is, is done, but, you know, there might be a second season. You have these other projects. Is every day different, or do you do you know that you're going to spend in the initial stages of a show? You're going to be spending X amount of time in the. I, weeds with I was it or... there for almost all of prep and almost all of shooting. Wow. And it shot in, in New York, right? It right, did. right before I left, I saw yes. a lot of the orange stickers in Brooklyn, right near where I lived. Yes, and our offices uh, were in Greenpoint. Oh man, now I'm just nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we shot all over the, all over New York, yeah. and and that's the other thing about the the imagery of it is um, is water falling water mm-hmm. being the permeable permeable membrane, mm-hmm. like from our waking world to our dreaming world and back, and and that's why we shot in New York because it's you know Manhattan and all of New York is very much impacted by the water, mm-hmm. with the rivers and the bridges and the it's it divides us and it connects us. Yes. So it was the perfect place to, to set the, the, the show. But, um, but in terms of how I handle things, when something new is up um, and about to launch, I'm there almost the entire time. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm very hands-on. For the first two and a half seasons of The Walking Dead, I was there in Georgia almost every day. I still you know, am part of all the conversations about the scripts and the season arcs and casting. Um, I watch every cut of every show that I'm on. I give notes on those. Um, I try to go to as many mixes as possible, as many sound mixes. Um, and I that's probably why I don't sleep much. <laughs> but when you do, you're also dreaming about how to fix the rig truck. So it's <laughs> pretty am. much 24-7. Yes. Um, I want to come back to The Walking Dead, of course, but I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind, to go back in time a little bit because I wanted to ask you about, about the, the, the breadth of your career. Um, I was reading... Uh, transcript of a talk you gave um, a year or two ago, and you spoke about your beginnings in the industry working for the legendary Roger Corman. Um, And you talked about an interview you had with him, I believe, and stop me if I'm getting any of this wrong, please, but that he had an opening for an assistant position, but that he he didn't ask you the questions you had prepared for, and the questions you thought you were going to get were about typing how many words per minute you could type, or, um, but instead he was asking you more about bigger picture questions. Is that fair? Oh, he was very to the point. He basically said, what's your career track and what do you want to do yeah. ultimately and as a woman in 1978 I mean you essentially thought you were applying for a job as his executive assistant for life hopefully right? and hopefully you'd get that job right. um, and, and that's not the way Roger looked at anyone male or female coming in to his you know fantastic little factory um, it was uh, the acknowledgement he was he is today even so self-aware that he assumes that he's a way station 
mm-hmm. and that you'll move on. Yeah. And uh, and I was not prepared for that. Was that partly because he was that? Be, do you think more because he was sort of forward thinking, or because he was just so always so understaffed and always making? No, so many he, things no. That yeah, he I mean, there's needed. no way you could say that. I mean, there is literally no one else in the business that would ask someone. Yeah. You know, ultimately, did they want to be a producer, a director, a writer? You name it. No one would have asked that of a woman other than Roger Corman in 1978. Because he was the only one who was willing to even. I mean, that w- the first time I worked on set, uh, which was on Humanoids from the Deep, uh, there was a woman director. Yeah. I mean, talk about a really, really rare animal. It yeah. was the woman director back then. Women were writing, editing, directing. You know, direct uh, editing trailers. Um, COO was uh, Barbara Boyle, so it was it was literally not the greatest foundation for me as to what I was going to expect later on in my career because right. I assumed that it was a gender neutral business. What was the atmosphere like? Was it like a like a, a pirate ship that everyone was on, or was it, or did it feel like a bubble in the sense that you were all working on the same thing together? And as you learned later, it was not reflective of the industry. It was really a bubble because we we. I mean, I would go to MGM, which is now Sony, to the lot. That was the only time I would go on to a, mm-hmm. a real studio lot because that's where the MGM lab was. And when I was head of marketing, um, you know, I'd go there to preview um, to, to preview various cuts of trailers etc but other than that i mean i had no interaction with anyone working at a quote-unquote real studio Mm -hmm. um do you think that the way that that he operated and the the, just the the amount of production that he was working on is there any line you can draw between that and working in television just in terms of the demands of the production schedule and the sort of never-ending well even on a roger corman show you got more than 20 days to shoot something right. and that's different um, and we get and you know uh, falling water seven and a half days per yeah. episode and walking dead is eight i mean it's crazy but it is still good training because you don't have enough time and you don't have enough money and and that's great and that's great preparation for for television i i do feel like that's one of the least understood aspects of television to this day which is that as we cover it and talk about it and come to expect cinematic excellence in just you know in just about every hour or half hour of television we watch the production reality well that's why there really should be split categories again i mean yeah. back in the old days of the cable awards yeah there were you know if you were basic cable it was a different category than premium cable right because premium cable and streaming i mean Game of Thrones has 23 or more days to, to shoot an episode and weeks and weeks of post. And they're shooting in three different countries. And, and we don't. So, I mean, it really is, you know, comparing apples and oranges. I think we should bring back the Cable Ace Awards. There you go. I think it's time. <laughs> it started it's, here it's, now. <laughs> it's, an under, it's not the most popular opinion, but I'm ready for it. Um, you, you talked about what the industry was like uh, for a woman in the 70s. And I'm curious about that specifically because, obviously, um, you know, one thing – you hear about a lot is that you know there are racism persists sexism persists always but there are different flavors of it there are different gradations of it how would you characterize the the sexism that you encountered in the industry in the 70s and 80s versus the 90s or versus today obviously your circumstances no change absolutely no different it's never not changed a bit across the board the way it's expressed the way it's oh yeah out. absolutely and and people who think it's changed yeah uh must be men who are deluding themselves Right. Well, so for me, this is not in the, the um, necessarily in the film business, but one thing that I can't get out of my head of recent events is that picture of um, of, uh, of Roger Ailes and Rudy Giuliani outside of Trump Tower in the car, smoking cigars, literally like cartoon villains. And I'm like, oh, it's not even. This isn't a black and white film. This actually is the face of that entrenched culture and there it is and it was always there you, and you know, it's still there today it, it, even if it was hidden behind you know um whatever social niceties it had been hidden behind it's just there and you know we all have to go through and i assume you do too sexual harassment seminars Tra- right of course yeah um so i have to do it before every before the the premiere of every season yeah. on a show and it's hilarious because you know when they talk about the kind, that kind of harassment. I'm thinking, you know, the fact that we're still talking about it. Yeah. And these are these are current examples. It right. really hasn't changed. 
Um, there, there's the expectation that we're going to be civil to each other and that grown women in their 40s and 50s won't be called sweetie or honey or girl, but we are. Um, so it's, it, 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 you know, it's, it's not the same as a guy being called dude. No. Although, I mean, I don't know anyone who would call Roger Ailes or <laughs> Donald Trump dude. No, probably not. Um, I, I certainly wouldn't like to. Um, do you, well, one thing that you have been able to do, um, among many other things in your career, is give women directors a chance to direct on TV. And there's been a lot of overdue reporting on that enormous disparity, um, you know, disparity that exists certainly in, in movie, in the cinema as well. Um, and yet, you know, we, we talk about the early days of Walking Dead and Michelle McLaren, who I think is one of the best directors working full stop, um, Breaking Bad, Game of Thrones, Walking Dead. I don't know what her career goals are, but the fact that she hasn't directed a motion picture is Well, she, is crazy she was offered one. Right. Um, but she turns out, you know, at least in her initial discussions, actually didn't have the same amount of freedom that she had directing television. That's interesting in terms of creative freedom and mm-hmm. creative choices. Mm-hmm. Um, do you get, I mean, do you feel that you're, in a, are you in a position, do you give people advice about how to handle sexism in the industry or is it just, or is, there, or is your advice just what you If you've gotten to the said? point that you're working continuously, yeah. you already know how to deal with it. Wow. It's just that. Pervasive. Pervasive and yes. built in in terms of your, the, I mean, you know, it's, people don't do it around me. Yeah. Uh, I won't tolerate it, but the consequences for me saying something, um, there really aren't any. But uh, but for someone else, you know, they're, they're still considered to be consequences for someone who who speaks up for themselves, and uh, you know that hasn't yet to change. I wanted to go back to um, a few other points on your on your IMDb page. Um, you, you, the, after leaving Roger Corman, you worked on the Terminator, co-wrote the Terminator, produced the Terminator. Um, th- there's a famous story, origin story of that is that is that. James Cameron had this dream, this fever dream about a metal hand. Because no, you, it wasn't the metal hand. It was, a, it was the entire burnished endoskeleton yeah. emerging from the flames. So you, you were working with him, at, at, with Roger Corman. Were you one of the people who, when the fever broke, heard the story? And how was this? I was the this, only person who heard it. He called me. So t- what, so what, well, I mean, we'd worked together. I'm, I had recommended him. He'd been the model builder, building spaceship models on a film called Battle Beyond the Stars, mm-hmm. written by John Sayles. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was quite a factory. It's yes. amazing who passed through there. Um, and a retelling of, um, you know, of uh, Akira Kurosawa's, um, you know, great film um, that then became Magnificent Seven. Oh, right, yeah. Um, Seven Samurai. Seven Samurai. So um, so we worked together, and, and, and I'm the one who recommended him uh, taking over as art director. So he went from model builder to art director, which is you can only do working for Roger Corman. Yeah. So, and I was the assistant production manager on the show. So we both committed that we'd go off, direct our, or and produce our first films, and the second one we'd do together. So he was in post production in Rome on Piranha Two: The Spawning. Mm-hmm. Sure. Saltwater Piranha That Fly. Uh, Can't and, get that guy out of the water. <laughs> no. And then I had uh, and I had finished. Um, Smokey, uh, not Smokey and the Bandit. Uh, maybe it was Smokey and the Bandit. Anyway, it was it was it was Rogers' ripoff of um, of the successful film. <laughs> right. And um, so th- we were thinking about what film would be the one that we would work on together. So that's when he called me. And what was your reaction to this 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 image? I mean, did you immediately hear how excited he was? Did you see what he saw, or did it take some convincing? No, he, he basically said, it's science fiction, it's the future, he's a cyborg. Um, and then we started figuring out how to put the meat on the skeleton, so to speak, yeah. and, and really flesh out the story. And, and it started with a necessity, which is we can't afford to do an entire show in the future. Um, so it needs to be time travel, and then it can be contemporary Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. And once we had established those parameters, the rest of the story flowed. It's amazing because the, the movie is such a touchstone. People love it so much, and it's, it spawns so many sequels and other stories that essentially was a, when you hear about the production, it's like a low-budget film. I mean, the, the, the work that you had to do. Of course do, it was a low-budget film. I mean, you know, we, we shot it in 50-some-odd days. 
on a budget of um, direct costs $5.6 million. Is there a moment, you have so many things that you're responsible for in shepherding a, a production, well, any production, whether it's a small one or a larger one that you've worked on, on later. Is there a moment in each production, or specifically to the Terminator, where you think, where you allow yourself to think, oh, may, oh we've got something. Oh, maybe this no. is something. No, I mean, listen, the first screening that we had, people said it was a down and dirty exploitation film. They were embarrassed to have funded um, but and would, these are people who funded it who said this. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I and thought you meant like a public that, screening. No, and that it would be out of theaters in the first two weeks, and that's why they wouldn't put any advertising money toward a second week because there wouldn't be a third one. I did read that the, that the, that the, that the it was sort of not dumped in theaters, but it was snuck into theaters, and it did okay for a week, and then it fell behind George Burns's "Oh God, You Devil" in the second no, week. No, it it, it was, actually uh, climbed five percent the second. Oh, week. it came up, but still, George Burns was was lording over I mean, Schwarzenegger uh, briefly. I, I I don't know. It's a funny time in Hollywood, I think, when that would be that would be possible. Um, there's a there was another quote I wanted to share with you because after Terminator, uh, you went on to work on Aliens, um, which was a little bit of a bigger production. It was fourteen million. So so, yes. and, it's more uh, than double. More than double. And uh, 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 this is a uh, your quote here, but um, people said they looked at it as if you know Terminator was a low budget film, but Aliens is a big studio feature, as if there was a different set of skills needed. And you said the skill set is is transferable. So when you said we were talking about the skill set being something you can transfer no matter what you're doing, I imagine it's the same skill set you bring to television. How would you just? What is that skill set? How do you describe it? Well, I think you have to be a a uh, jack of all trades. Right. Um, you don't necessarily need to be a master of any. You have to have 360 vision, and you have to be able to see the knock-on consequences of every decision that you make. Because I think that filmmaking is the art of compromise, and mm -hmm. you need to know because you're never going to get everything you want. And, but there's going to be there's going to be a, a tipping point where if you don't hold fast to saying no to that one thing that yeah. will destroy the project creatively, then you've ruined it. Um, so you have to know all of the compromises you can make up to a certain point. Is there a different compromise ratio between film and television? Because the, the version that I'd always heard is that, you know, TV, it, is essentially imperfect. You move on to the next one. You have your seven, your eight days. You know, you you just have to keep moving. Whereas filmmakers, there are filmmakers who who I believe would say who wouldn't agree with what you said in terms of it being a medium. And of they compromise. won't be working much longer. Or is it? Or is it that it's the job of a good producer to sell the compromise to the to these filmmakers and make them feel like it was their idea to begin with? I mean, how much of well, it? Well, I mean, each filmmaker is completely different. You can't just there, there are no course. gross generalizations as to you know, what works best for a particular filmmaker, um, whether it's television or features. Right. Um, but, the, but the truth is, since you're telling, let's say with The Walking Dead, 16 hours of storytelling and the amount of time that you take to shoot one feature, mm -hmm. of, of course, I mean, you know, you're, you have less room for error. Mm -hmm. And not only that, you don't, get to, you don't get to sort of stop and cut it all together and, you know, see how it's working at the end of the day and then go go back three months after you finish shooting and do reshoots for a month mm -hmm. um so you, you have to be you have to be right more and you have to be able to make the right decisions in the moment because there's going to be a knock-on effect in television in a way mm -hmm. that you don't have in features mm -hmm. Well, this might be a minority opinion, but of, of the films you collaborated on with Cameron, my, my favorite might be The Abyss. Um, how do you remember that period? Because that had to have been an extremely challenging film to make, just logistically. Well, we, we fondly referred to it as The Abuse. <laughs> um, it was impossible. Yeah. Um, what people don't recall is, even though the budget was $40 million, which seems, which seemed like a, a, a significant amount yeah. then. No one had ever done what we were doing, uh, so we were we were inventing the technology as we went along. Something that Jim continues to do, <laughs> right? Uh, and and it was it was a real struggle. It was a struggle because every day was impossible. Um, and I mean, one of the first things that Fox did was decide that 
we might go over budget, so they got rid of my line producer. So we had, at one point, five different units filming, and it was myself and a UPM. And that was it in terms of the producing team. Um, you know, it was we were shooting six days a week with a non-union crew. Wow. In, uh, you know, in rural South Carolina. I think it's a testament to what the balance that we discussed earlier and the balance you try to strike in your projects, though, that for as enormous as that movie was and as enormous as the ideas in that movie were, the, the moment that I, I never stopped thinking about is the resuscitation scene. Um, I still, that's still my go-to reference often when I'm thinking as, as a writer or as a critic or something. I think about that scene all the time. And, you know, that that's the $40 million didn't go into that scene. That was that was the writing and the acting and, and, and the way it was shot. Um, but it becomes as crucial as Well, I mean, if you look else. at it, there's the moon pool in the background. Yeah. That's a huge, that's significant. Right. Obviously, the way they drown, the way that she had to, yeah. to drown, that took us four days to shoot. The water rising in the submersible. Yeah. I mean, all of those things that go into getting to the point where she needs to be resuscitated yeah. were incredibly expensive. Of course, yeah. And, and technologically difficult. Um, and, uh, you know, when I look back and I think, my God, we were crazy. <laughs> but, you know, we were, we were all able to take on the challenge. And, and the, the most surprising thing, really, is that the one thing that Fox never asked us about was, you know, the, the water snake, or as Jim calls it, the pseudopod, yeah. right? The, the, the NTI being able to control water that's, yeah. that, um, you know, that turns into Lindsay's face. Um, no one had ever done that kind of CGI before. And Dennis Murin at uh, ILM took over a year off to learn how to create that level of 3D CGI. Is it part of your job in the moment if other people start to notice that this is crazy, to be poker-faced and say it's not no, crazy? No, no, you have to be a magician. You have to say, no, no, look over here, look <laughs> over here. And yeah. and you, you refocus them. Yeah. So that the one thing that you don't have answers for yet... They haven't asked they, they, that. They don't, they don't look at that. Do you look back in general? Or do you, do you go back to these films and look at them? And, or are they too awash in the specific no, memories of making No, I mean, them? you know, this was the 30th anniversary of the release of Aliens. Yeah. So we had a panel at, at Comic-Con right. in San Diego. There was a screening. And then in November, they uh, are going to be showing the film while the symphony plays the score, the fantastic James Horner score. Mm -hmm. God bless his soul. Um, in Royal Albert Hall in London. And we're going over for that. And, and, and those kinds of celebrations are fantastic. Um, but I don't have a Gail Ann Hurd Film Festival that I <laughs> run for myself every year. That you curate on, on no. Blu-ray and <laughs> you, move, you move on. Um, you know, a lot of the films we're talking about um, are helped create this idea of what a, a sci-fi blockbuster, what a genre blockbuster um, could be. And basically the, the lingua franca of filmmaking now is sci-fi genre blockbusters. That's what gets made. And I find it um, noteworthy that you found... Um, a, a different kind of creative freedom and certainly professional um, uh, excitement working in television. Is there, am I drawing, a, is there a correct correlation to be drawn here or? I think the interesting thing is that television is a producer's medium and features are still a director's medium. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's really rewarding for those of us who are producers. Um, the directors are fantastic. I love working with them. Um, they don't create the final cuts um, you know, they move on mm -hmm. and the producers stay with the show mm -hmm. from the beginning of the season to the end and, you know, in, into the future seasons. So that's, that, that's really rewarding. I mean, when you think about it, you know, we're having a marathon on AMC for The Walking Dead, you know, 88 episodes. Hard to believe that over the past six years, we've got 88 episodes and the f premiere of our eighth season mm -hmm. will be our hundredth episode that's that's a lot that's a, a lot of producing and a lot of knives to the head and you know and and working with the best group of people i've ever worked with in in by the way in what i imagine what i've heard is not the easiest conditions either. no i mean it's they're they're impossible i mean they are impossible the heat the humidity the ticks the poisonous snakes 
I mean, you name it, and we're up against it. Yeah. And that's why the, the, the crew behind the scenes never gets enough, enough acclaim and, and appreciation. Right. I mean, the production challenges, I mean, it is, we're, we're talking about movies that you made in the past that were quote unquote impossible, but you just use the word again. I mean, and, and to produce it at such a consistent level of, of quality and satisfy the fan base and keep these actors and crew members alive. You uh, know, and, and, and so, I, you know, I mean, literally alive, not the characters. Yes. You know, so the people who are there day in and day out are line producer Tom Luce and co-EP Denise Huth who've been there from the very beginning. I mean, they just don't get enough credit, and they really should. Before um, we go full into The Walking Dead, I wanted to ask, um, just, in, just in your take on the lay of the, the movie business right now, um, because there's this, I, it strikes me that you, you couldn't make The Terminator now because everyone wants to make The Terminator now. And what I mean is you couldn't, everybody wants to have the, you know, the, the killer app or the, the piece of IP that can, you know, dominate and, and inspire many sequels and et cetera, et cetera. But I what, think those but what you films did was are original. still being made. I think those films are still being made. They're under the radar. You have to go to festivals to seek them out. Yeah. And then those directors generally get snatched up and thrown onto big features that they might not necessarily be quite prepared for yet. That's right. And so, I mean, we can, without naming names of people who weren't prepared, we could talk about someone who apparently was. You could take a look at someone like Colin Trevorrow, who I've talked about on the podcast before, who made, I, I take your point, you know, his, his, he made an indie film that was a little bit genre called uh, Safety Not Guaranteed. And then his next feature was the reboot of Jurassic Park, and his next feature after that is a Star Wars movie. Yes. That's enormous. So it's still happening. But it that's is... enormous success by any measure. Right. But I sort of want to know what his Terminator is, if you know what I mean. Not his Terminator 4 or 5, but I want to know what his his idea was and whether there's room for him to make that. I think there is. I mean, it, once you've... We're still, as I said, in a director's medium. Mm -hmm. And once you've proven yourself enough times, you get to be Jim Cameron and Chris Nolan and people who make original films, not, you know, not just remakes and sequels. You, you still believe that it's possible? You know, I, I'm an optimist. Yeah. I, I look at the glass and say it's half full. Um, and, and I think not this, not necessarily this year, but for many, many years, I have watched a minimum of 22 of the foreign language films during uh, the Academy's, mm -hmm. um, you know, foreign language um, sort of bake-off. Mm -hmm. And there's fantastic filmmaking all over the world. We just don't necessarily get to see it here, right. which is why I, I always look forward to seeing those films. Because you might not get another opportunity, and they are so powerful and speak to the human condition. And, um, you know, it's, it, I, that's why the, the hope for me is that there are so many different opportunities to see films that may not necessarily get a right. theatrical run. That is the Galen Hurd Film Festival. That's the one that you need that's to start. That's the one I want to curate. <laughs> um, just so moving finally to The, to the, to the Walking Dead, which um, remains one of, if not the most popular shows on TV. Now, a few years into it, you know, it, 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 it was a, I remember a few weeks, well, moving back, I remember a few weeks after it premiered, I, I talked to um, uh, Sean Ryan, the, the, the great TV producer and writer, and he said that he feels like this was, this was TV's Jaws moment in the sense that no one knew they could do this and no one saw it coming and now every, it's going to change everything in terms of what's possible. And yet the property, I mean, Robert Kirkman's comic book existed and had a devoted fan base before it became a television show. But the property passed through, I believe, NBC, passed through FX. It, ex it was there. It was there to be taken, and it just needed you know, the, the right combination of someone who can communicate the vision and the, the network ready to take a chance on it. Why, why couldn't people see it? Why was it hard? Why, well, I, why think, it I hard? think there are a number of reasons. I mean, the, the first one is when you consider a successful comic book, except for rare exceptions, I mean, that's selling 30,000 yes. issues a month. Yes. So if you go, oh, wow, that's big, I mean... And you look at how many people you need as viewers, that doesn't necessarily translate. It's more than 30,000, yeah. But it wasn't back then. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, oh, no, for I, viewers, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So, oh, no, yeah. so I, think, I think there was reticence there that the IP might not be as well known and certainly might not travel well because mm -hmm. it is an international business now. Mm -hmm. um, and there had been what I thought was a really excellent pilot 
um, actually called, starring Ray Stevenson, who I worked with, um, called Babylon Fields, I think, that was a, a zombie pilot that mm-hmm. didn't go forward, and people thought, well, they've tried that, it didn't work. Right. So throw out, throw out the baby, the bath water, yeah. the bath, the bathroom, the whole house. Exactly. Okay, we, 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 we tried that, it didn't work. Everyone had seen that pilot, and they thought, okay, how do you sustain it? Mm-hmm. And they didn't think, well, you know, this is a successful comic book that's been going on for years and had been at that point. Um, and the creator is sustaining it. Not only that, it's growing bigger and bigger. Mm-hmm. It had, I think, the first year, maybe the next year, it won the Eisner, which is the Oscar for, you know, the equivalent for comic books. And so it was not only um, commercially successful, but critically acclaimed. And it had a fantastic cast um, and it, what, what I think people couldn't get past is that it's a show about the characters. It's not about the zombies. Right. Um, and they, they're always like, literally, how do we keep the idea of, you know, zombies at a certain point won't be scary anymore? Well, if you'd actually read the comic book, you'd realize that very quickly it's established that, um, that the greatest fear that we have to face now or in a zombie apocalypse are other people. That's 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 the that's the killer app of the comic and of the whole idea. As the characters become more accustomed to the world, the zombies become uh, like a you know force. They're a force of nature. It's a it's a tornado. It's a thunderstorm. But that's not what's going to get. You. I mean, it might get you. Sometimes right. it does get them. I shouldn't say that. But that's not the thing. That's 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 the worst in the world. Um, what was so? When did you come onto the project? Um. When F- Frank and I, Frank had been involved with it before because he was involved in the NBC version. Of version. This is Frank Darabon who, who Frank adapted Darabon. and yes. steered. And he, um, and they had rejected that as a pilot and had been sent everywhere. And re- re- you know, it was the rejection slips like you would get, I suppose, if you had had a, a manuscript you'd sent to publishers. Yeah. Uh, and he didn't even want to hear about it when I called and said, "Look, let's." Let's see. He didn't have the rights at that point. We went down at Comic-Con because at the time Robert Kirkman still lived in Kentucky. And we met with him, and, um, and ultimately everyone reached an agreement, and we took it into AMC. And I knew we were, I knew we were probably um, going to have uh, a more open audience because the executive, Jeremy Ellis, who's, who we took it to, mm-hmm. When I said, I got this crazy idea, um, The Walking Dead. And when he said, you mean Robert Kirkman's The Walking Dead? I thought, wow, this is, this is going to be a receptive audience. Mm-hmm. And what we also didn't know at the time was that AMC was looking for programming in their Fear Fest block. Yeah, I think people don't realize that one of the reasons AMC picked the shows that they picked was that they, they had this library of, of movies and they wanted to be able to program alongside them and launch well, it was also new what, what with the even that they more the importantly to. had their highest ratings of the entire year, right. more so than Mad Men and Ulti- and you know, and I think Mad Men was the only one that was on, and then Breaking Bad, um, but they had as you know, as they call it, more eyeballs. Yeah. And so, if you're going to promote something, you want to promote something to an audience that's first of all receptive because it's a similar genre, and secondly, um, you know, you've got you're reaching the most people. So tell me the story of the morning after the premiere when you got the ratings or when you first started to hear about the ratings. Um, I don't remember, to be honest. W- All I knew was that meant that maybe we got to keep doing it for another season. But That's the, the, Those were our ambitions. Our right. ambitions were not to be the biggest show on television, but to be able to continue making it for at least another season. Pretty clear. I think it was pretty clear early on that you would be able to make it for more than... Another right, but the, too, the, right? the figures were, were great. Yeah. Um, especially for AMC. Yeah. We didn't realize that they, they, would, they would climb. Keep growing and growing and growing. There, was, there were very few examples of shows, especially serialized, you know, that would more than double in viewership. Of those 88, you said there are, you're up to 88 episodes now. Of those 88 episodes, what stands out to you is what, what story on that show or moment are you most proud of? Or development or character, what what do you hold up in that? Because I mean, there's just so many. I mean, you, you, it's it's hard, but I think one of the episodes that resonates with me is the Grove, which is the episode when we have the 
you know, sadly, sociopathic little girl mm-hmm. who's convinced that the the zombies, the walkers, um, you know, are really not bad, and she's going to prove it mm-hmm. by killing her sister, and her sister com- will come back, and everything will be fine. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, there are no child psycholo- psychologists working in the zombie apocalypse, at least that we've encountered. Not yet, anyway. And uh, so, you know, so Carol, who's really taken these girls as, as her surrogate daughters, mm-hmm. because her daughter has already succumbed, um, has, to, has to kill, has mm-hmm. to kill Lizzie. And um, and then in that same episode, uh, so you know, in beautifully brought to life by by Melissa McBride, and then the character of Tyrese, Chad Coleman. You've got you've got two people. Um, the character of Carol had killed his girlfriend, mm-hmm. um, thinking that she could stop a contagion at the prison. So she essentially killed someone who was sick in cold blood, thinking that it was the right thing to do. Mm-hmm. And Tyrese, who went into a violent rage over this unnecessary death in his mind, forgiving her for that, for everything. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, is the kind of thing that you never see, think you're going to see in a story about the zombie apocalypse. I'm glad you mentioned Carol, just because for me, um, I think that the development of that character and and the performance by Melissa McBride is probably my favorite Thing about the show ongoing um, it's such a surprise you know if you had watched the first few episodes um, what that character would be what that character could be and what she could deliver in that performance it, was it that way behind the scenes as well or was there a larger plan in place let's put it this way um, Melissa McBride had been in Frank's film The Mist mm-hmm. she'd given up acting she was working as a, in a casting department in, in Atlanta and she was like, I, he said, I wrote this part for you. You have to do it. And she said, yeah, but you can write me out, right? I mean, you This know. is one show where you can be written out pretty easily. Yes. <laughs> and, and Frank was like, well, you know, I mean, she's still alive in the comic book. And, but he, you know, he had to make that promise to, to Melissa. Yeah. I mean, it, here she is still with us. But at that time, it was not a career that Melissa planned to continue. And what a loss that would have been. Oh, absolutely. And I think she's just, she's really, really I mean, if there's, performer. you know, if there's any, if there's any sort of, you know, the fans always are upset that we don't, that we don't get nominated for Emmys. Um, you know, to me, that, that's not why we make the show. Mm-hmm. But I think overlooking her performance and not even getting a nomination, that that's the one thing I think that, that, that probably seems unfair. Is there is there a part of making The Walking Dead that makes it the ultimate producer show? Because if something isn't working out, you can always you can always excise them pretty easily. You know, I, I think the fact that we haven't followed the comic book and that there are characters that are right. still alive in our show that are dead in the comic book and vice versa, you could say that. <laughs> you, you, but you never go so far as to say it's like you know, uh, cut a page out of the comic book of a character's death and slip it under the. No. The dressing room door, just to keep them honest. No, no. I mean, the, the <laughs> great thing is, for the most part, none of the actors wants to be killed off. Right. And when they get the phone call from Scott Gimple, the showrunner, and, you know, he explains to them that, they're, that their journey on the show is coming to an end, um, they, they go through the multiple stages of grief, of, of grief and they try to argue. Um, at one point, Melissa was going to um, not continue with the show, and we realized that that would have been a big mistake. But once again, that was honoring the request that she had initially made. One of my, um, and I'll, I'll let you go in a moment, but generally one of the reasons why I love TV so much as a, as a fan, as a critic, um, is the fact that it's constantly evolving and constantly changing, and that you know you can watch something get better, you can watch something get worse, and sometimes that's even more interesting, and then you can watch it rebuild uh, into something completely different. Is that an aspect of the medium that you have come to appreciate as well? Because a film you can work on, you know, with your heart and soul, but at a certain point, it's out in the world. I mean, I guess if you're George Lucas, you can keep fiddling with it. But in general, that is the final version of the film. TV, you can, you can constantly, uh, you get another shot at it, basically. 
Well, you get another shot at it as long as you're renewed. <laughs> <laughs> True. True. Um, you know, I, you get when, when you're in cable, you get I think a little more leeway. Um, in network, if your ratings aren't strong right out of the box, right, uh, you tend not to even be around for the rest of the season. True. So I think I think there's a sliding scale there, um, but but the interesting thing is there is as John Landgraf of FX says, I mean, there's so much content out there that you need to come out of the gate strong enough and have enough people engaged um, that, that you can continue to tell the stories. And, you know, and, and if you are really out there, um, you know, if you're bold, I think like the way Falling Water is, it's even more important. Well, as someone who can, um, you know, who has the stature and the track record and the, the talent, to get something, if not greenlit, but you can get something closer to the door. You can get something on the air. You can get into the rooms with with, with whomever to get it to get it where it needs to be. What what is it that grabs you? What is it first and foremost now? You know, at this point in your career, whether it's the Falling Water script or you know when you spoke to Frank about Walking Dead or or the, the numerous other projects you must have in development. What what is the what's it's, the first thing? It's all very simple. I have to want to watch it because I'm going to be spending hours and hours not only on set. But in post production, and if I'm not engaged, I'm not going to be the best producer for that particular project. So everything that I take on, I have to believe that that I can add something to that. That I'm not just, you know, it's not just a, another, you know, widget coming off the factory assembly line. It's it's something that that I have particular insight into, and that I'm passionate enough about. Um, you know, to give up having any social or personal life whatsoever. <laughs> or sleep, apparently. <laughs> or sleep. Um, it, but luckily I dream. Luckily you dream, and luckily there's a show that may teach us how to do one, if not both, a little bit better. And that brings us full circle. Okay, Kayla and Hurt, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me. It's a real pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.